Beautiful. Good morning. Happy Pentecost Sunday. How fitting it is that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birthday of the church on Memorial Day weekend. The Apostle Paul once said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord gives us freedom, and yet freedom is never free. Freedom is always costly, and we recognize that as our country, that we celebrate the freedoms we have, and, uh, and including the freedom to worship God uh, as we are this morning. And so this weekend, we remember those who have paid the ultimate price and their families for the cause of freedom, and we honor and salute you who have served or are serving in the armed forces for the cause of freedom. If you have served uh, in the armed forces, uh, we would love to just express our gratitude and thanks if you'd stand uh, that we could acknowledge your service and the freedoms that we have in our country. Thank you very much for your service. And of course, the ultimate freedom we have comes from Jesus, who gave his life for the freedom that we have. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So let's worship God. Good morning, St. James. So let's join together um, in worship this morning. So please rise in body and spirit. thank you for this beautiful day and a new opportunity to glorify you. May your spirit fill this place as we joyfully sing praises to you. This morning, help us to focus on you, Lord. Help us not to miss what you have for us today. May we shout your name and declare your goodness out through the sanctuary doors and into our community, shining your light into the hearts of everyone we encounter. Open our hearts this morning, God, to what you have for us. We love you. Amen.
Good morning, St. James. Such a beautiful morning. It is my pleasure to share announcements with everyone this morning. First, I want to call to your attention the connection card if you are visiting with us. And um, if you want to let us know anything about you, including prayer requests or whatever, feel free to fill that out and drop it in the offering. And second, I want to thank everyone who came out yesterday to help with cleanup and on church grounds. What a wonderful job. Thank you. <laughs> so next week on Wednesday, there's a dinner and concert at 530. So if you want to RSVP and haven't, you could do that today out in the narthex. And also, I think there is a sign up for some food out there as well. The last thing I want to bring to your attention is Summer Seminary. You have one of these in your bulletin. And I personally love Summer Seminary. And I hope you guys will get to come out and see. Uh, there's a great lineup of speakers all summer long. Thank you so much.
Good morning, everyone. I'd like to lead us. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to lead us in a prayer celebrating this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. So, will you uh, join me, please, in prayer? We thank and praise you, Father, how the Holy Spirit moves, particularly in community, where hungry, thirsty people for you gather in corporate worship, in small groups, building us up in the faith, building us up in hope and love, and pointing us all to Jesus as our treasure beyond all treasures. We praise and thank you, Lord Jesus, how you, together with the Father, sent the Holy Spirit to be our daily comforter and companion, our divine helper in this journey to grow in love and in joy and in peace and in patience and in kindness and in gentle gentleness and in self-control. We praise and thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power to help us grow in trusting in our Heavenly Father, help us grow in surrendering self-interest and in abandoning ourselves to our Heavenly Father's will. We praise and thank you, Holy Spirit, for your convicting us of sin, thereby helping us to stay humble and helping us overcome selfish pride and selfish and, and, and uh, spiritual pride. Lastly, today, we, we praise you, Holy Spirit, for how you give us better and better understanding of the word of God over the course of our lives as we eagerly listen for God's spoken word to us as individuals. Your name is power. We pray this in the name of our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to invite the kids to come join me up here, please. So today I'm going to kind of put you to the task. I was hoping I could get your help making up a story, but I need characters and I need actors. Is anybody willing to play one part over here and one part over there? Who wants to? Okay, Harrison, you're up. Go ahead, like Izzy. Perfect. Okay, let's put you over here, Izzy. Harrison's over there. Okay, so let's make up a story. Um, what's this character's name? Fred? Fred. Okay, his, no, she doesn't like Fred. Wait. What do you think? Freddy. Freddy. Oh, no, that's much better. No, she's right. Freddy's much better than Fred. Okay, so this is Freddy. What's this character's name? Oh, you've got one on the tip of your tongue. You have a good one, don't you? Penelope? Yes? Okay, Penelope. So that's Penelope, and that's Freddy. So I'm going to make up two hypothetical stories. Hypothetical is like it didn't actually happen. It's just pretending it happened. So Freddy has to clean his brother's room every week and give his brother a birthday present every year. And every year, his brother does not give him any birthday present back. And his brother never helps to clean his room. But that's the rules. He has to do all these things, but he doesn't get anything back. Does that sound really awesome to you? No. No. Penelope has to go into school every day and put up with this really mean girl. What's the mean girl's name? Jane. Okay, I hope there aren't any Janes here. No offense. 
Okay, so Jane just is so mean to Penelope every day. She steals her lunchbox, and she throws her books on the floor, and she's so mean. But the rule is Penelope has to still be nice to Jane, and Penelope has to even go home and pray for Jane. Does that sound like a really great setup? No. No. Okay, so which, which kid do you think has a harder situation? If you think it's Freddie, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, and you think both of them. Which, which does Jane have a harder situation? Raise your hand. Okay, let's go by audience applause. Who thinks Freddie has the harder situation? Okay, who thinks Jane has the harder situation? Ooh, we got Jane's the, Jane's the winner in this one. So who would make these kids follow these kinds of rules? Who on earth would make up these rules? You don't know? Yeah. Can you believe Jesus actually told us we need to love our enemies, even when they knock our books out of our hand and steal our lunchbox, and we have to forgive them and pray for them? And he also said that we have to give things to people, like clean their room or give them birthday presents, and not expect anything in return at all. So those are really hard rules to follow, right? He had disciples back then that were so mad at some of his rules, they said, nope, I can't do it, and they just walked away. That was it. They can't do it. But I think you guys are all special enough that you can do it. Do you think you can do it? Yeah, I think you can do it too. You want to pray? Okay. Dear God, thank you so much for Jesus and the challenges he gives us to be better Christians. In your name we pray. Amen. And round of applause for our actors here. Excellent job, you guys. Good job. Thanks, kids. Hey, I want to, uh, as we approach the offering, just uh, more than anything, express gratitude. Thank you for your generosity. I mean, generosity comes in all kinds of form. They, forms, the care we give one another, the time uh, that is offered. Uh, as Sandy said, uh, we had a great turnout yesterday. 28 people came out for the campus cleanup. Uh, three of those actually to prepare and serve lunch. A few of those came actually from the neighborhood church who said, hey, we're worshiping here too. We want to be a part of helping out and maintain facilities. So there's a just a growing partnership there. And so thank you uh, for your time in that. And also thank you for your uh, financial generosity that makes things happen. You know, every week we celebrate what God is doing in and through the life of our church and our giving and the variety of ways that uh, lives are impacted in very real uh, terms. And, and sometimes that might feel like, wow, every week we're getting up and we're asking for more, we're asking for something. And, uh, and the main purpose for sharing what we share during this time is to celebrate all that God is doing and the opportunities we have. And I wanna just make really clear, um, our expectation or our, our, uh, our celebrations each week uh, isn't an expectation or even asking you to participate in a new way every week. I say, no, they're asking me to do something more or something different. It's, it's expressing an opportunity where your heart might say, wow, I want to be a part of that. And your heart might resonate with that and even feel like that might be something God is calling you to. Other times you may say, um, I'm really glad we're doing that. I don't feel personally called to that. But uh, it's great to know about what God is doing in and through our church life by that, just the ways that the Spirit is moving. For example, one of our ministries is school partners. And we've made our way through another school year and uh, that's been wonderful, and so food has been provided every week. It started with 10 families, and then 20 families, and now we're up to 29 families who receive food on the weekend, children in our neighborhood who receive food during the weekend because their only meal, some of them, their only meal is at school, and so this provides food for them uh, during the weekend. And so school's out and we think, oh, so the need's no longer there. And actually, the need ramps up. And so there is an opportunity. And if, you like, if you're like me, I just need clear instructions. And so um, we have these paper bags in the narthex. 
in the little school bus that's there, and it gives clear instructions about what you and I can put in these paper bags to help provide for children in our neighborhood this summer. And so you don't have to wonder what to get. You can just see which of those items you'd like to get, put in the bag, drop off, and we'll make sure it gets to the children and the families uh, and the families that we're serving right in our neighborhood. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So I just, I celebrate what God's doing with school partners. I celebrate what God is doing in our midst. And so now is the time for our offering. Woke up one morning, fell out of bed. Room looked so dark that I thought I might be dead. Well, I need a savior who can get me through the night. Walk me through the valley of the shadow and out the other side. Look in God's mirror, see who I am. I shake and tremble, cause I know I stand condemned well. I need a savior who can wash me pure and white. Walk me through the valley of the shadow and out the other side. shepherd who can take me home. I need a shepherd to keep me safe in the fold. I need a shepherd who can be my guide. Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Get dressed, put on my clothes. They're dirty and smelly, pants full of holes. Well, I need a savior who can dress me up just right. Walk me through the valley of the shadow and out the other side. White robes, righteous deeds of the saints, sanctified to become what I ain't. I need a savior to stay close by. I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd. Walk me through the valley of the shadow and out the other side. Thank you so much for that great music. <laughs> All of you.
as a, a prelude to our passage from John 6 today. The setting is that uh, Jesus was teaching at length in a synagogue at Capernaum, that town on the northern shore of the Lake of Galilee, where Jesus did so much of his teaching. And at a very critical point in, in his teaching, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, Jesus' audience heard that as a blasphemous statement. One, because Jesus invoked the name of God, the, the great I am, for himself. And two, because he followed up that statement with this. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. I am the living bread who came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, then a very sharp argument ensued among the Jews that were listening. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, that's where we pick up our passage today from John 6, beginning with verse, 50, uh, verse 53, taking it to verse 69. Let's listen for God's word to us. And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is, is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on the bread, on this bread, will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. <clears throat> on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Of course, that would happen in just a little while. The Spirit gives life. The, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You, want, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus then asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The grass withers, the flowers fade, people come and go. The Word of God stands forever. The 
So <clears throat> not all those who followed Jesus from place to place and listened to his, listened to his teaching uh, for a season, not all, not, all, not all of them stayed with him. In this passage, we have many turning back from following him because of one of his hard teachings. And in that hard teaching, Jesus said that it was necessary for someone to feed on him the bread of life in order to have eternal life. Now, fleshing out that statement in, in line with uh, what Jesus taught else, elsewhere, this, this is not a reference to communion, incidentally. <clears throat> but fleshing it out, Jesus meant for them by saying, feed on me, he meant for them that they were to take the whole of who he said he was and all the words that he taught and the miracles they saw him perform with their own eyes, they were to take all of that into the deepest part of their, their, themselves, their souls, and then follow the Lord exclusively in loving allegiance. They were to draw their whole life and sustenance from him. And Jesus said that as they fed on him in, in these ways, he'd be sufficient for all the spiritual nourishment, all the physical provisions that they would need in life. Plus, Jesus taught that their living this way was the gateway to eternal life. Those for a while disciples who turned away from following Jesus, they just found that teaching too much. They, have, they, they surely had to have been impressed with much of Jesus' teachings and the miracles they saw but they, they could not bring themselves to cast away their own ways and, 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 and the way that they wanted to live in, in order to follow Jesus first in loving allegiance and commitment. And as they turned away from following Jesus, then Jesus turned to the twelve. You do not want to leave too, do you? And Peter answered, and you'll note that he answers for the, the whole group, all, all the 11. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know and to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Oh boy, <laughs> there, there is so much for us to honestly think about here. <clears throat> I, I'm struck by the fact that in, in contrast to Jesus' audience way back then, we know all about what Jesus sacrificed for us on the cross. We know all about the empty tomb. We know so much more than they did. We know the really crucial things. <clears throat> but don't we still balk at some of Jesus' heart teachings? Are, are not some of his hard teachings, and there are many of them, a bit too much for us to cast our own ways aside and the lifestyle that we're accustomed to in order to, to follow Jesus first in loving commitment and allegiance, in loving loyalty, Here's a book for your library. The Hard Sayings of Jesus by F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. F. Bruce is a re was a, a renowned New Testament scholar. And he examines 70 of Jesus' hard teachings in this book. This book has 250 pages just on examining, unpacking the hard teachings of Jesus. This is what it says on the back cover. Like his original hearers, many people today find Jesus' sayings hard. 
Some sayings are hard because they are difficult to understand. Others because the demands they make on us are only too clear. F.F. F. Bruce examined 70 of the hard sayings of Jesus to clear away the cultural and historical difficulties which keep us from grappling with the real challenge of Jesus' message. Evident in each chapter is F.F. F. Bruce's keen evangelical scholarship and pastoral insight. Okay. How about Jesus' teaching that if we love father, our father, our mother, our son, or our daughter more than him, we're not worthy of him? Is that too hard a teaching? I, I think perhaps it is for more than a few. How about Jesus' oft-repeated teaching that if we want to be his disciple, we're called to put ourselves on the back burner and take up our own crosses of self-sacrifice to follow him exclusively. And added to that one, Jesus said that if we cling to our own lives in self-protection, ultimately we're going to lose our lives. And yet if we give our lives away, in loving self-sacrifice to others, we will find life. Is, is that a teaching that is a bit too much for many to follow Jesus? I think it is. Or what do we do with Jesus' and admonition to his disciples back then, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? That's Luke 7, verse 46. Do we really hear that and take that to heart as present-day disciples? I I'm not sure that many of us are that convicted by it, where we confess to God Oh, God, oh, Lord, I say, Lord, Lord, all the time when I'm in a bind. But by doing what you say is certainly spotty. And, and I feel sorry in my heart about that. Please fill me with your spirit to help me live out Jesus' teachings in a way that marks me as someone that lives with integrity as your disciple. Lord, please help me with that. Or take the whole Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, most all of it is hard teaching. Um, most all of it is swimming against the current of our contemporary culture. <clears throat> You'll probably recall that everyone who's seen any episode of The Chosen, that the, at the beginning of every episode of The Chosen, there are... <clears throat> There's a graphic with many fish swimming together with the current. And then, you know, two or three uh, seconds into the graphic, we see just a few, only a few fish that are more lightly colored. And they're swimming with the other fish but they're swimming in the opposite direction against the current. 
and the light-colored fish are to represent the chosen. Now that is a very poignant graphic. For in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, many enter through it. But small is the gate, and, and narrow the road that leads to eternal life, and only a few find it. That's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. I think most of us balk at that teaching. Fact is, it's rarely preached in today's churches in America. We often disregard Jesus' hard teachings because they really challenge our comfort zones. Particularly those teachings which call for our first love and allegiance to Jesus before anyone else or anything else, whatever the circumstances. And as a result of our disregarding those teachings, our following Jesus often lacks first love passion. And we cruise along in our own strength and self-sufficiency and relative material comfort, focused mostly on what author Kay Warren, the wife of uh, Pastor Rick Warren, what she calls the kingdom of me. And in her book, uh, uh, Dangerous Surrender, what, what, what happens when we say yes to God? And she, she talks about the kingdom of me in a very convicting way. But bottom line, she says the kingdom of me is not the gateway to eternal life in the kingdom of God. Now that's what Jesus taught. Now as many of Jesus disciples, other than, other than the 12, as they turn back and, and no longer follow Jesus because of a hard teaching, Jesus asked the 12, you do not want to leave too, do you? And then Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else are we going to go? I'm really convicted by, uh, I'm actually riveted by Peter's response to, to Jesus' question. He, Peter had his personal problems in, in, in following Jesus. His brash bravado got in his own way more than once. Yet he walked with Jesus for three straight years. And he listened to his teachings. And he witnessed Jesus living out his teachings by examples. And Peter and the others, other disciples, heard all the hard teachings. Yet, even without knowing yet, the most crucial and miraculous events in Jesus' life and ministry, Peter still came to know at a soul-deep level 
that indeed there was nowhere else to go. There was no one else to go to for the words of eternal life. And with those words of eternal life come life fulfillment that lasts forever. Now, <clears throat> that's Peter. Now, some of you may be asking, how do I come to the same conclusion that Peter came to, given that some of Jesus' teachings are so hard? Many of you may be th thinking, I'm honestly struggling with this. Here's how I believe any serious seeker after God, in other words, anyone hungry and thirsty to grow in the grace of Christ and in the more intimate knowing of Jesus, here's how anyone, any serious seeker of God can come to Peter's conclusion. If you have become familiarized with the life and teachings of Jesus through your involvement here at St. James or, or elsewhere, and you would say that Jesus has won your respect, maybe he hasn't answered all your questions or, or quieted all your balkings at the hard teachings, but you would say that Jesus has won your respect. Now it's really a small step. Once Jesus has won your respect, to put your whole weight down on what he taught. That's faith. That's the step of faith in Jesus Christ. And as anyone takes that step of faith in Jesus Christ, putting your whole weight down on what he taught, even though you don't understand it all right now, Jesus will then fill you in a fresh way with his Holy Spirit to dwell within your heart. And the Spirit of God will soon move you in a soul-deep way to sense Jesus' commanding authority. You just feel it. You just sense it in your heart. And the Holy Spirit will soon open the eyes of your heart to see clearly and with conviction that only Jesus' words, all of them, are the words of eternal life. Furthermore, the Spirit helps us to obey all these teachings. The Spirit provides the want to. We want to obey them. That's the work of the Spirit, too. So, coming to the same conclusion as Peter is really an inside job of the Holy Spirit. It's God in you. It's, it's God working in you, in your, deep in your soul. It's God's doing. So today we celebrate the Holy Spirit's being the third person of the Trinity who brings Jesus' teachings to our clearer understanding over the whole course of our lives. And we best come to that fuller understanding of Jesus' 
whole message in a small group. In a small group of hungry and thirsty seekers after God. Most important step for some of you to take next. Where you meet with other hungry seekers and grapple with these teachings together and come to a deeper understanding of Jesus' whole message. That's not going to happen by yourself. Let's pray together. Lord, we do desire to go deeper with you. No turning back, but following you to the very end of our days on earth. We thank and praise you that your words are trustworthy and true. And we thank and praise you that you have sent the Holy Spirit to inspire our first love for you and your word and to teach us Jesus' words of their fullness. We thank and praise you, Lord, for your boundless mercy and grace to make us more like Jesus in our earthly lives and to ultimately bring us to where you want us to be, together with you in your kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please rise and bow to your spirit and continue in worship with us? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto Friends in Christ, wonderful on this beautiful Sunday morning to be with you and to worship with you and to listen to the words of eternal life and to know that um, that includes us, all of us, of faith in Christ. So be good to yourselves, kind to your neighbors, remembering that most everyone we meet carries a heavy load.
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be working within us to transform us degree by degree to the likeness of Christ. Woke up one morning, fell out of bed. Room looked so dark that I thought I might be dead. Well, I need a savior who can get me through the night. Walk me through the valley of the shadow and out the other side. Look in God's mirror, see who I am. I shake and tremble, cause I know I stand condemned well. I need a Savior who can wash me pure and white. Walk me through the valley of the shadow. dressed, put on my clothes, they're dirty and smelly, pants full of holes, well, I need a savior who can dress me up just right, walk me through the valley of the shadow, and out the other side, white robes righteous deeds of the saints sanctified to become what i am. i need a savior to stay close by i need a shepherd i need a shepherd i need a shepherd walking through the valley of the shadow and out the other side 